All right, well, praise the Lord. Glad uh, you could join us tonight here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Uh, we've got our regular Wednesday Bible study. Pastor talked to me uh, Sunday and said, had I gone through all my notes? I said, well, as a matter of fact, no, I got about halfway through my notes. And he said, well, good. Teach the other half. <laughs> so kind of caught me a little bit by surprise, but that's all right. I like to be instant in season and out of season when it comes to teaching the Word. So uh, I've got the other half of my notes here on my computer, and we'll jump right in where we left off last time. Um, as I was saying before we got started, it's been an interesting day. I've had my head in computer code all day working on the uh, Roku channel. And uh, so I'm having to adjust, get back to reality <laughs> instead of being in the code. So uh, that's a challenge. I know those of you like Dick that have programmed know exactly where I'm coming from. You get, you get just caught up in debugging it and trying to get everything just right. And uh, you just have to stop and say, it'll keep. I'm coming back to it later. Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh my, well, praise the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll get into the Word tonight. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your Word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. And Father, I just believe that he will guide us and direct us tonight as we study your Word and receive some things that you have for us that are important regarding this subject. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, while you're doing that, a uh, few comments on what I was teaching last time. I'm not going to go back over anything. This is part two of part one. <laughs> so if you missed part one, go back and, and catch it. It's on the uh, YouTube channel, the Expedition Triad uh, YouTube channel, as well as where else? I guess that's mainly where it's at. Uh, it's on Facebook too, so be be on the Facebook uh, page as well. But at any rate, uh, we're talking about know those that labor among you, and uh, the importance of knowing the people that you're listening to, um, knowing where they're coming from, if they have any particular agenda or doctrine or whatever that they're trying to peddle, <laughs> so to speak, uh, or you know whether they're just sharing directly out of the Word of God. We we have to be the ones that discern that. That is not something that God leaves up to those that are doing the teaching. Obviously, he instructs us to do, you know, to minister the Word of God effectively and, and all of that. But uh, your individual responsibility is what I'm trying to say, is to hear the Word and to judge what you're hearing uh, based on the Word of God yourself, which means you're going to have to crack the book and get in it Amen. and uh, find out what the Bible says for yourself. Uh, it's great, don't get me wrong, to have ministers that you uh, appreciate, that you understand, or are sharing the Word of God as effectively as they know how. Uh, I'm a, a, a great uh, proponent of finding a minister that you receive from. There's connections that, digress just a little bit here, there are connections that are made in the Spirit with certain ministries. Um, there are people that I like to listen to, that I've listened to for years. Uh, Brother Hagen, I just get a whole lot out of his teaching. Brother Copeland. Um, one minister you've heard me mention many times is Keith Moore. I just, I get a lot out of Keith Moore, his ministry. I tell you, he, he comes at it from a pastor's point of view, but also from a teacher's point of view. He is sound. He has a background of, of having gone to Rama and, and gotten all of instruction from Brother Hagen. Brother Hagen is, he recognizes as his uh, spiritual father. Um, and he just has a good old down-home way of putting it that I like. You know, I mean, I'm a country boy at heart. Uh, I've been involved with computers and technology for many years. But, you know, you get me out under a tree with a, a pocket knife, I'll whittle. <laughs> and uh, I got that from my dad. So, uh, you know, at, at heart, I tend to, to just be a simple guy, and I like to have that simple gospel presented. You know, uh, Brother Hagen talks about the fact that he used to try so hard to use big words. You know, when he first got started in the ministry, he, he used a lot of big words, and his wife would tell him, you know, you take 15 minutes to explain what one word that you just used means. She said, it's just hard to keep up with. 
it, it's confusing. And Brother Hagin went and prayed about it, and the Lord said, keep it simple. Just keep it simple. And so from then on, he tried to do that. Just keep it really, really simple. And, of course, listening to him for all the many years that I have, he definitely did that. He kept it very simple, and anybody could follow it if they were of a mind to. So praise the Lord. Um, the other thing I want to mention is something Brother Jerry said. He, he got me Sunday and said to Brother Bill, I didn't realize you were that bold. <laughs> Actually, the problem I have is being too bold. I have to throttle back. Uh, you know, Pastor Kid's with me about when I was on radio back in Greenville, and he heard me get into Scripture Wars. I was an ornery cuss. You know, I would hear some preacher talk about how the baptism of the Holy Ghost is of the devil, speaking in tongues of the devil. And so I would get into the Word, and I'd show everybody in the next radio program that it was all scriptural. And I would counterpoint all of what he had said. And, of course, he listened to my program, and the next week he'd come back and say the opposite. And it, it, we got into scripture wars, which is not fruitful. Don't get me wrong. I mean, bless their darling hearts. I imagine all those folks out there listening to that were going, what are these guys doing? I mean, Pastor was getting a kick out of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, he still talks about it today. But... Uh, over the many years, the low these 40 years <laughs> that I've been preaching, uh, I've had to learn to just, just be a little more calm and uh, a little more kind in my presentation instead of knocking people over the head with the Bible. <laughs> so just know that that is where I, I came from, and now over the years I have moderated and gotten a little more calm. But every so often it'll come out. You know, Every so often it'll just rear its head a little bit. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, it's kind of weird that, you know, he's saying this. You've got to remember the society he's in. In this society, there were still slaves, servants, and they had masters. And um, just because these folks got born again doesn't mean that they weren't out from under that system. And so here Paul is addressing Timothy, his young protege, and saying, look, if you've got people that are servants, they're under the yoke. I mean, technically, they're in bondage. But he says, let them count their own masters worthy of all honor. In other words, treat them honorably. As far as your perspective is, treat your master honorably. Now... Fortunately, praise the Lord, we don't have to deal with that situation today in terms of being a master-slave relationship in the natural. However, uh, there is a principle here of honoring those who are over you in the Lord in, in the sense of pastor of a church. We honor them. We count them worthy of all honor that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters... In other words, going back to the slaves here. If they have believing masters, they're Christians, let them not despise them because they are brethren. Now, again, think about this weird relationship they're in. You've got a guy who's a master. They, quote, own a slave. They have this relationship that they're working within that system, yet they're both born again. They're both brothers in the Lord. Very unusual situation uh, but he says, don't let them despise them. Don't have animosity about that because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, in today's world, this kind of teaching would, you know, people would freak out, masters and slaves, and telling them to obey their masters. And that's just ridiculous. Because we have an attitude that does not honor service. We're all in it for us. You know, that's the world's view. That's the world's approach to things. And so it's hard for us from our society to even understand what's going on here. But he says, these things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, and this is really what I wanted to get into, talking about ministers that are not teaching correctly, uh, if any man teach otherwise than his doctrine, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to uh, the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, 
but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, again, Paul is he's a master of using words. Uh, a pastor has pointed this out before that Paul used words very elegantly. He was very educated and, and he, he had plays on words sometimes. And because of those plays on words, we kind of, kind of sort of miss a lot of what he's saying that's kind of what would be in his realm, in his world, if he heard him, you'd think, oh, that was cute, that was funny, <laughs> you know, or that was a cute turn of phrase. You know, if we say certain things today, you'll think, oh, that was, that was kind of neat what he did there, you know. Well, that's kind of what he did here. He says, uh, supposing that gain is godliness, and we talked a little bit about this last time, there are those that look at people that are well-to-do financially in Christian circles, in our circles, word of faith, charismatic, whatever you want to say, and they say, oh, they have, they have a lot. They must, be, they must be spiritual because they've been believing God and they've, they've acquired all these things and so, so they're spiritual. Well, that's not really true. Gain, natural prosperity, is not a sign of godliness. Now, on the other hand, poverty is not a sign of godliness either. It has nothing to do one and the other. Money is just a thing. Money is something you use. Uh, I like what, uh, I think it was Fred Price said many years ago. He said money will amplify what you are. So if you are naturally stingy, you get a lot of money, it'll amplify that. If you're naturally a giver, you get money and you give it away. You know, you, you, your motivation doesn't come from the amount of money you have. However, the way it's been taught in the past years among Christians is that, well, we ought not have this old world's goods. And, you know, the old thing of, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, we'll keep the pastor poor and you keep him humble, Lord. You know, that kind of thing. It really shouldn't be that way at all. That, you know, that's not our call is to keep the pastor poor. And neither should it be expected of, of Christian ministers generally to be poor any more than we should expect them to be rich. You know, their financial standing has to do with the wisdom they have applied in the financial realm. Have they, they worked uh, a job? Have they earned money? Have they stuck money back? Or they, do they have a savings account? All these things, eh, that has more to do with the, what finances they have than whether or not they're spiritual. But what he says here is, there are those that suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what I mean about the turn of phrase. He's saying, you know, I just told you that gain is not godliness. However, godliness with being content is great gain. You have gained a lot if you can be content. And that's really what God calls us to do is to be content. Now, being content, see, this is where you've got to moderate and understand where, where the Scripture is coming from. Being content doesn't mean we say, well, I don't have anything. I should just be content. No. If you have a need, believe for that need to be met. Apply your faith. Um, if you have something at hand to do, uh, you know, I mean, I've earned some extra money recently selling old equipment on eBay. Stuff I've had laid around I hadn't used in years. I pick it up, dust it off, clean it up put it out on eBay, sell it, eh, get a few bucks here and there. So that's something I have at hand to do. I can get a little extra money in by getting rid of some old equipment. That's just me. You may have something else you can do. Maybe, uh, maybe you got somebody that really enjoys your pies, so you make pies and you sell them. I don't know. Whatever it is, you can do something to gain some finances, but don't just aim everything you do, everything you think at doing that. You know, it's, it's just something you do to get a little extra spending money. So if you are able to do that, stay calm, relaxed, content, 
do it because you just enjoy doing it, and you get some gain, then that's contentment with great gain because you've done it in such a way that you're not begging and scrawling and you know scratching to try to get a whole lot of money. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's, that's really the approach we should have. Unfortunately, there's a lot of preachers, sadly, these days that are in it for the money. Now, Paul said, you know, uh, one, one place he said, uh, uh, the gospel is preached, you know, whether it is for the right reasons or because they're trying to feed their belly, you know. Uh, so unfortunately, there are those preaching the gospel, and they're preaching the word, but they're doing it in order to get gain. And that really isn't the right motivation. So let's go on now to Titus chapter 3. Titus, again, uh, another minister here, and he's given us instruction beginning in verse 1. He says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves were also sometimes foolish. <laughs> I was talking about how I used to be a little rambunctious. Sometimes we used to be foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, in other words, after we got born again, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying that these things, and these things I, that, uh, I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he which is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Now, this is kind of harsh words here, and this is something that we were talking about briefly last week. If you've got a guy that insists on preaching false doctrine, he is preaching contrary to the doctrine you have heard, the doctrine that you were raised under that you know is scriptural because you, you've seen it in the Word, you've got revelation of it, you've acted on it. I mean, I told a guy on Facebook, he was talking about this whole question of whether tithing was legitimate. And I said, look, I've tithed all my life. And I've seen the results of tithing. And it is a way to honor God. And if you want to fuss and fight and fume, I'm not going to do it. I'm just plain not going to get involved in an argument over that. However, in so many words, what I was saying is, you've come too late to tell me that it's not literal, that it's not biblical, that it's not beneficial. I've seen the results of it. And... Uh, if he continues to preach and teach false doctrine, says, if a man is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, well, that means there is a first and a second admonition. You know, we do go to them and say, brother, here's what the Bible says. Now, that needs to be somebody that does that, not every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the body of Christ. That needs to be somebody that has authority to speak into their life. Okay, so for instance, here in a local church, that ought to be pastor. You know, I don't take it upon myself to try to, con you know, uh, convince anybody of anything, preach any particular doctrine. He and I pick at each other about the, the issue of, you know, when the church started. Uh, and it's funny. We, we kid with each other about it. And he told me before service, you know, or not tonight before service, but before this teaching, he told me on Sunday, he says, Now, Brother Bill, I know you're not going to teach on that. <laughs> and I said, No, Pastor, I'm not going to teach on that. Because it's unprofitable for me to get up and say, well, here's what the Scripture says, the reason I think that. you know, And then he'll get up and say, well, here's the Scripture, and this is why I think that. That particular aspect of doctrine does not matter one whit as co you know, concerning somebody's salvation. You know, uh, There is a doctrine. 
You know, the word doctrine just means teaching, by the way. And we think of doctrine, we think of some religious something or another. But really it just means a teaching. There is a teaching that uh, there were people that lived on the earth before the re-creation of the earth. Okay? If you haven't heard this, you might say, what? <laughs> but basically what this teaching holds is that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 1 and 2, where it says that uh, the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, well, that means there was waters there. He moved on the face of the earth. Well, that means there was earth there. But then he goes on and says uh, that he began to, in effect, recreate the earth. And when he talked to Adam and Eve, he told them now, replenish. Well, you don't replenish if something hasn't already been plentished. So, you know, I mean, so apparently, one could argue, there was a whole civilization that lived on the planet. It was wiped out by a flood. And when, that, when the waters began to recede, the Holy Ghost was moving over the face of the waters, and God recreated the earth. Well, praise the Lord. That's fine. You say, well, Dr. Bill, why isn't there more scripture about that if that's the case? Because that wasn't for us. You know what I'm saying? That whole generation, people, creatures, whatever they were, <laughs> if they had a Bible that God dealt with them about. They had one, but it wasn't ours. Ours starts in Genesis 1-1. <laughs> it starts at that point of recreation, if we accept this teaching. Okay. Now, whether or not you accept that as teaching that is valid, matters not one whit. You know? uh, that's called the pre-Adamic uh, theory. It's a theological theory. Uh, there aren't a lot of theologians that hold to it. Now, it just so happens that uh, Brother Hagen has mentioned it. Brother Copeland has mentioned it. Charles Capps has mentioned it. They teach it as though it were correct. There are scriptures that would lend credence to that. Uh, as a matter of fact, when God told Noah, I will not... I put a rainbow in the sky and said, this is a symbol of my covenant to show you that I will not destroy the earth by water again. Well, he had just done it, but apparently he had done it before. <laughs> so he was saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know what I'm saying? I did it the first time, wiped everybody out, I started over. When I started over, I started in Genesis 1-1, things happened. Now I've done it again. I've wiped everybody out, and we're starting over, Noah, with you and your family. It says a few were saved. And Brother Hagin likes to say, how many does the, is, does the Bible say is a few? Well, it must be eight because Noah and his family were eight people. So it was a few that were saved, so there must be eight people to be a few. I like that. Anytime I think about that, I think, well, I know what a biblical few is. So anyway, uh, so that few started over, and then we had the current civilizations that arose after that. So God's not going to destroy the world again that way. He's going to do it differently next time with fire <laughs> instead of water. But uh, praise the Lord. But we know what's coming with that because of the book of Revelation. Uh, but anyway, all of these things are doctrines that are interesting. They're fascinating. They're fun to talk about. You know, they don't really matter that much. You know, and if, if the, the New Testament church began in the book of John when Jesus said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost... That's fine. If it began on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost entered into his ministry, that's fine. Either one of those points is earlier than us. <laughs> so it's just a matter of history at this point, and I'm not going to argue with anybody over it. You know, I have certain reasons that I believe it was that way. Pastor has certain reasons he believes it's the other way. But we're not going to have him falling out over it. And that's really what a mature Christian should do is not have fallen out. I'm going to have, as Pastor was pointing out Sunday, and I thought that was awesome what he was saying, we've got a lot that we agree with Baptists about. Now, I was raised Southern Baptist. we got a lot that we agree with Baptists about. I, I was raised to believe in the virgin birth. Praise the Lord. I was uh, raised to believe in the literal miracles of the Old Testament. 
you know, the splitting of the Red Sea. I was raised to, to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that his earthly ministry was three and a half years, uh, that he went to the cross, that he died, was buried, was raised again from the dead to our justification. All of those things I learned in the Baptist church. And I got born again in the Baptist church, praise the Lord, uh, back in April of 1969. So, uh, you know, I appreciate what I learned from the Baptist. I appreciate all of the doctrine of the Sunday school and, and the, we went to Fort Caswell and we had teachings down there and uh, I went to see Billy Graham meetings and you know there's just been a lot of things I've gotten into through the years. Got a lot of things out of that. That's good. But once I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, November 10th, 1973 at a full gospel businessmen's convention, Things changed. <laughs> Needless to say, the Baptists were not too thrilled. Now, at the time, I was young, uh, 73. Let's see, I'd have been a junior in high school. Uh, so I was in high school. But even at that time, before I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I used to teach in the First Baptist Church in Denton, North Carolina. The pastor would turn the service over to me, and I'd preach. And, you know, I had a calling on my life, and... Uh, taught what I knew, which was precious little, <laughs> but what I knew, I taught. And uh, believe it or not, my big, my big area of teaching was last days. I used to look, love to teach on the last days. And I was squirrely. I was just squirrely. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad there's no tapes of that teaching. Oh, man. Anyway, I, I would be burning those tapes if they were still around. But anyway, uh, so, but, you know, I... I Taught what I knew, which wasn't much. But so I then received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I came back from that weekend where I received up in Raleigh at this meeting, and I was excited. Oh my goodness, I was excited. Speaking in tongues, I was excited. And so I went to my pastor, bless his heart, and I said, Pastor, can I have the next service? He said, Sure, Brother Bill, no problem. So, I mean, I'm a kid. And I'm excited. So I had the, the Sunday night service. And I went to that Sunday night service. And I started teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I had everything written down, all the scriptures they used, you know, uh, that they taught at the full gospel business meeting. And I started talking about speaking in other tongues and so forth and so on. And then I said, now, who wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues? And some ladies raised their hands in the congregation, you know. Well, the pastor's sitting on the back row, and he's just been, he's been, oh. He's had his head in his hands. He's just been shaking his head. And finally, he said, Brother Bill, take him in the back. Take him in the back. So we went back to a Sunday school class, and he took over the rest. Yeah, I don't know what he said after we left. But we went back in the back, and these ladies got filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. Praise the Lord. So I was excited. I was thrilled. Well, the next Sunday night, I came back to church, and the pastor got up to preach. And he preached on how it was all of the devil. <laughs> Tongues was of the devil. And it was for those weak-minded individuals that needed a natural evidence of speaking in tongues. And so uh, if, they were, if you were intelligent at all, you wouldn't be doing that. Well, of course, you know, I'm getting ready to go to college. And, I'm, I'm, and it just crushed me. I mean, I was emotionally, I thought, oh, man, I, I don't understand this. I didn't know it was against their doctrine. Nobody told me, you know. Well, of course, they're handing me booklets about how it's all the devil and everything. And, and uh, I didn't know what to do. And, and I didn't have any other teachers that I knew that were preaching it. I didn't even know there were other churches that taught about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know there was a Pentecostal church in town or anything. I mean, I was Baptist. <laughs> That's all I knew. So uh, what I ended up doing, again, young Christian, I went to the Lord. I said, Lord. Because, I mean, by this time, I mean, I've been speaking in tongues. I've been having a time. I've been laying hands on folks, getting them healed, and all kinds of things was happening. Uh, but I said, now, Lord, I don't want to I don't go crosswise of the word, and I don't know if this is right or not. I don't, maybe I got involved in something I shouldn't be involved in. i tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> Making a deal with the Lord here. I said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to speak in tongues one more time, one last time. And if you don't give me some indication that this is legitimate, that I won't ever do it again. Well, you know, I do not recommend this. This is not the way to approach this problem, okay? But I was a kid, and I didn't know any better. So I started praying, and I'm praying along, praying along, praying in tongues. 
And this one word kept being repeated over and over. You know how sometimes it's just a word that kind of gets, starts getting repeated? And it was the word lingui. And I kept saying that, lingui, lingui. And I thought, well, okay, what does that mean? But it was stuck in my head. I just couldn't get it out of my head. So I thought, how do I find out what that means? I mean, it was just beginning to irritate me. You know, it's almost like that feeling you have when a song gets stuck in your head. And it just keeps going over and over and over. That's the way this was. And uh, I thought, okay, i got to figure this out. So I went to my high school library. What am I going to look up? It's a word in tongues, you know. So I pull out this big, giant dictionary. They had one of these super thick, it was like, when it was open, it was six inches on either side. It was just huge, you know. And so this thing opens up, and I get to flip it through the L's. <laughs> Lingui, you know. I'm like, how in the world? It's, it's not even English. How am I going to find it? And I found a word that was really, really close. And I got to looking, and it was a, an adjunct of the word linguistics. And I got to looking at it, and the word was Latin, and it was the exact pronunciation lingui, which meant tongues. <laughs> and I said, all right, Lord, that's it. Hallelujah, it's real. That's all I had to hang my hat on. <laughs> I didn't have anything else I could hang it on, so that was it. Now, that's kind of the equivalent of throwing down a fleece, which you can do that and you can get fleeced. So that is not the approach you ought to take. But that's where I was at, and that was the beginning of my adventure. Now, from that point, I ended up getting books by Brother Hagin, Why Tongues. I got books by Brother Hagin on what is faith. And then I began to see that there's more to this than just speaking in tongues and getting folks healed. There's also faith and the confession of your mouth and on and on. And I began to grow in those things. And so that was, that was 73, 74, 75. By 1976, I started hearing Brother Kenneth Copeland's radio program and Andrew Womack's radio program. And I was getting into the word really strong at that point. So from then on, it was just shooting up like a rocket, rocket spiritually. But uh, from humble beginnings, that's how I got started. And uh, the point is that that pastor in that local church, literally, I mean, think about this now, he had authority in that church. He was the one leading, spiritually leading that church. And he had, in his case, had somebody come in and teach something that he thought was not, not correct doctrine. Now, I believe it was correct doctrine. Okay, but that's besides the point. From his perspective, he had to correct that error. Okay, and that's the same thing that happens here uh, in, at Expedition Church. A pastor hears somebody say something, a minister, a teacher, this has happened in the past, where they've said something, and then he's got to get up and say, okay, this is going around, people are saying this, but it's not scriptural. Let me show you what the Word says. And there have been all kinds of things. People were teaching there for a while that the Holy Spirit was an it, not a he, that he wasn't personal. Uh, and pastor had to go back and show that the Scripture says that he is a he. He's the third person of the Trinity. He is a person. The Holy Ghost can speak. The Holy Ghost can, you know, has attributes. Uh, it's not the force in the universe and all this kind of stuff. So he had to teach that and he had to correct that. So the thing is, he is in a position that he could go and and have an admonition for somebody and correct them. Now, in the case of this particular individual in the church that was teaching some of these things, he did go to him one time, he went to him a second time, and finally the guy ended up having to leave the church because he just couldn't agree with us doctrinally. Uh, and that's a shame. It's a shame that that happened. But at the same time, if somebody is teaching false doctrine, you've got to correct it and you've got to deal with it because otherwise it can affect others. And particularly, you know, the Bible says if, if you offend one of these little ones, uh, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and cast into the sea. You don't want to be offending young Christians in the body of Christ and teaching them false doctrine. That is just that's something you should not be involved in. But here in verse 9 it says, Avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions. Now there's whole churches that base their doctrines on genealogies. They trace their genealogies all the way back. And there's a lot of teaching regarding genealogy and genealogical, if that's a word, teaching that is 
unscriptural, troublesome, and contentious. Um, let me give you a pet peeve. <laughs> long as long as I'm giving you pet peeves, let me give you a pet peeve. This whole doctrine folks have got going about uh, uh, family or uh, heritage, uh, the exact word won't come to you, but uh, basically, uh, oh, generational curse. That's what I'm trying to think of. Generational curse teaching. The idea being that because my grandpa was, yeah, he wasn't, by the way, my grandpa was a preacher. <laughs> but if my grandpa was a drunkard, then there was a, there was a spiritual predisposition toward drunkenness. And it was like a spirit that was in our family. And because of that, that grandpa being a drunkard, then the father, my dad, might be a drunkard, and, and I might be a drunkard, and just be passed on. And we got to break that generational curse. That whole area of teaching really has to do with genealogy. It has to do with your natural birth and those who came before you. Well, don't get me wrong, in the natural, strictly in the natural, if somebody is, uh, you know, beats their kid, then that kid might grow up to beat his kid because there is a natural tendency to mimic what you see. But it doesn't have to do with generational curses. It has to do with what you've been taught, right. what you learn, okay? So this whole idea that there's some spiritual, weird, generational curse thing, and we got to break that curse, and people will have long prayer sessions and Holy Ghost meetings and casting devils out and throwing holy water and just doing all kinds of crazy stuff over generational curses. And every time I hear the term, I go, hmm... Because <laughs> there's no generational curse. There just isn't one. You say, Dr. Bill, surely everybody, people teach that. Give me a scripture. Just, just one. Now, I know there are some scriptures that talk about the sins of the Father, you know, being, you know, on the, the, the descendants or whatever. That's talking about sin. That's not talking about spiritual de predispositions, okay? There are things that occur in families that should be rooted out. Don't get me wrong. But the way this is taught, it's like some magical, you know, if we break this curse, then my life's going to be better, and that's what i got to do kind of thing. Here's the thing. This is the bottom line for me on generational curses. I'm not of my father in the natural. Amen. I'm not of my grandfather in the natural. Amen. I am a descendant of the Lord Jesus Christ as his brother, He's my older brother. I'm his younger brother in the Lord. I am of my father, God. So my generational blessing comes from the Lord. My predisposition in life comes from Him. I'm not bound by my family. I'm not bound by my uh, upbringing. You know, whether I was raised one way or another. Now, if I was raised a certain way and I've got to deal with emotions over that, that's an entirely different thing than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that look at a genealogical hierarchy and try to make some spiritual point over it, okay? If you have foolish, unlearned questions about genealogies and they're contentious, they're strivings about the law, they're unprofitable in their vein. That's a good King James way of saying they're useless. <laughs> they do not amount to anything. And uh, that's why he goes on to say here, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, now this is where it gets a little harsh sounding, knowing that he which is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Now remember last time we read the scripture where it says that they are captured by Satan at his will and have become shipwrecked and that uh, we need to pray for them that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. And it's going to be really ultimately up to them to repent and to turn from that false doctrine. Now, I got into all this mainly because, like I said, I was seeing some things on Facebook of some, actually some preachers. They were bringing up doctrine and beating the people over the head with it. 
And it was literally bludgeoning folks over various scripture and various doctrines and so forth. That is just not profitable. There's a lot of young Christians out there that see preachers doing that, particularly on Facebook where it's wide open anyway and there's no throttle. And uh, they get confused. I, I had somebody, when I was on radio, they, they told me, says, you know, Brother Bill, <laughs> lady wrote me a letter actually. She said, Brother Bill, I listen to WLXN every day, all day long. And I listen to all the preachers that are on WLXN, and I'm thinking immediately, uh-oh. And she said, you know, I'm just having a hard time getting everybody to, to jive because this guy's teaching one thing, this other guy's teaching another thing. Well, she's doing the best she can to try to make it all fit together. And there's a lot of teaching just not going to fit together. There are people teaching things that are just flat wrong. And a lot of times if we come out and say, brother so-and-so is teaching something that's wrong, then people look at us, you're judging. See, you shouldn't be judging. Uh, you're being harsh. You're being critical. Uh, you're in the wrong because you're doing that. Well, if you notice here, uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he says, Holding faith and a good conscience with some which have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He names these guys by name. Now these guys were ministers, quote unquote, in the early church. They were going around teaching doctrine that was unscriptural. And he names them by name. He calls them out. And there were several other places where he calls out other ministers and says, these guys are, are wrong. They're teaching things that are incorrect. You need to avoid them. You need to ignore them. You need to not listen to them. I mean, that's the same thing is true today. At some point, we're going to have to get enough spiritual wherewithal to say, sorry, but what this guy's teaching is wrong. We can't promote their ministry. We can't have them come to the church and preach. I mean, there have been some people that have preached here in the past that you'll notice aren't coming back. Now, pastor's not going to make a big deal of it. He's not going to say anything much about it. But some of those folks were preaching and teaching things that were unscriptural, and he, they just aren't coming back. Why? Because pastor has the oversight to make sure that what we hear is scriptural and is sound. And I praise God for that. I'm thankful that we have a minister, a pastor in the church that will take that authority, that will take that responsibility to keep us protected, that he'll do that. And there are times, unfortunately, that he may have to name a name and say, hey, so-and-so is teaching this. <sighs> Look, I'm sorry, but we just can't go that way. Don't let that bother you. That's the bottom line. Don't let that bother you. Don't think, oh, no. Pastor's trying to be critical. He's trying to be mean. Anything like that. Uh, you know, that's, that's one reason I think God gave us teachers like myself. We can say things that pastors can't say. <laughs> we can make points maybe they can't make. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes it's worth just saying this is the way it is. And so I don't mind doing that. And like Jerry was saying, sometimes I get a little bold because... If it's in the Word of God, I'm going to preach the Word of God. I'm not going to preach something just because, well, so-and-so likes to hear this. Hey, you got itching ears, you ain't going to like me. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you what the Word says. That's it. And if it doesn't jive with, uh, with your particular, you know, uh, flesh, then get your flesh in line. Because the Bible's the Bible. Now, just because I say it doesn't mean it's so. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you need to see it from the Scripture. You need to see it from the Bible. You need to see it for yourself. Uh, Brother Hagin always used to say, don't believe it because Brother Hagin says it. Find it for yourself in the Word of God. The bottom line, even with operating in faith, is you've got to get a revelation for yourself. Amen. You're never going to operate beyond the revelation that you have personally. Okay? Now, we ought to say that again. That's a Selah moment. You're never going to operate spiritually beyond what you have not received into your spirit yourself. You know, if, if I had just heard about healing, just heard it was available, and then I jump out there and try to believe for cancer to be healed, and, uh, you know, it's been in, eaten at somebody for years, and they jump in and try to do that, they may not get healed in time. 
because they haven't built it in. They haven't come to that revelation to know that they know that they know, you know, that their knower knows that they're the heel to the Lord. Um, when I was in the hospital, that's right where I was. I knew what the Word of God said. I knew what I believed. I had people who were in authority, doctors, telling me, you will be dead by this Friday. You got a week to live. That's it. We're sending you home. Well, I could choose to believe that. It would have been real easy to have chose to believe that. But I chose not to believe that because I knew better. Amen. I knew what the Word of God said, and I stood on the Word of God, and now I'm here today. Glory. Praise Glory. the Lord. Glory. Well, that's great, Brother Bill, but, uh, you know, don't you just think it was just God took a notion? No, God didn't take a notion. He already had a notion yeah. for me to be healed. God's notion is that all people should be healed. Amen. Healing's been provided. It's whether we receive it. It's whether we believe it. Amen. And that's on us. You know, I, I've, I've heard people say, well, now my Uncle Fred now, he believed God and he died. Well, I don't know about Uncle Fred. I can't tell you what Uncle Fred was believing. I can't tell you what he was saying when he was alone in his bedroom at night to his wife when he wasn't at church. Now, at church, he may have been saying, I'm believing to receive my healing, brother. Hallelujah. And then he gets home and he's, woe is us, and he's crying and he's moaning because he hurts. Well, as Brother Hagin says, if you got, and, and Brother Moore too, if you got the whine in your voice, you're not going to get it. If you're busy be having a, a pity party, you're not going to get healed. You need to get some guts, some, some internal fortitude, and say, I have taken my healing. I am standing for my healing. Bless God, I'm the healed of the Lord. Jesus bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases. By His stripes we were healed. If we were, then I am. And so therefore, that is my stand, and that's exactly what I believe. And you got to get real bold about it. you got to... If... You know... Brother, Brother Copeland actually said this one time. He said... Somebody asked him, said, Brother Copeland, what if I die confessing I'm the healed of the Lord? He said, well, praise the Lord. I'd, I'd, what better way to die with, than with the Word of God on your mouth, on your lips, and you're saying, I'm the healed of the Lord, bloop, and you're gone. Because you're just going to step over into glory, and you, you know, you're going to still win. Amen. That's the thing, you still win. Amen. But for, you know, I am going to keep confessing the Word of God until till my dying breath, which is a long ways off. Amen. Because I'm, I'm going for 120, hallelujah. <laughs> so the thing is, uh, take a stand on the Word. Be serious about it. Be solid about it. Uh, you got to be like that little woman, you know, with the issue of blood. She made her way through the crowd. It was illegal for her to be there. She, with that issue of blood, she wasn't even supposed to be in company of other people. But she pulled her way through that crowd. She reached out and grabbed the hem of his garment. She said, if I touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I touch it, I'll be healed. If I touch it, I'll be healed. She grabbed a hold of it, and she got her healing. And Jesus said, whoa, I felt power go out of me. Who touched me? Well, everybody was touching him, but they weren't touching him with faith. And so she touched him with faith, and then he told her, he says, hey, don't fear, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. Not my garment. Not the anointing that's on me. Your faith drew that out of him and made you whole. And that's exactly what you got to do. You got to be tenacious. Got to hold on to it. Go for it. So, anyway, praise the Lord. A uh, little bit of healing teaching, a little bit of Holy Ghost teaching. All right, anyway, uh, we've gone all over the place tonight. But I wanted to share some of these things with you, and uh, particularly that, uh, let's see if I got. One other portion of scripture here. No, that's, that's where I wanted to go. Okay. Uh, we left off with Titus 3.10. A man that is a heretic after the first second admonition reject, knowing that he which is subverted had sitteth being condemned of himself. So that is what I had put together after doing my study on uh, knowing those that labor among you. But the, the good side of this, we'll, we'll end here on the positive side. The positive side of this is if you know and honor those that are teaching the Word among you and you have confidence in their teaching, as I have confidence in Pastor, as I have confidence in Brother Keith Moore and others, Brother Copeland, uh, then it's great to just relax 
and receive from the Word of God. I had such a good time going to uh, Missouri recently and visiting Ben down there uh, in Springfield, Missouri. And on the way back, we were listening to Brother Moore on uh, MP3 stick I had in the car. And he taught five sessions on the, on, uh, what was it, the Greater Faith Conference was the, the whole conference. And he was talking about faith and how it worked and your mindset, how that entered into it. And it was just so much depth there. And I was having such a good time. Blaine and I were just rejoicing and praising the Lord that we could just let go and relax and hear the Word of God and just be refreshed. Amen. That did more for us. I mean, it's been ages since we've had a chance to get that concentrated together in the Word of God with no distractions. I mean, what are you going to do? You're sitting there in the car, you're driving down the highway, and that's playing. I mean, all you can do is concentrate on what he's teaching. Yeah. And, you know, if you're, if you're driving a car on the highway and it's just a long, straight highway, it's not like your brain has to be that engaged. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty much all autonomic, you know. <laughs> So I'm listening to him teach. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's good, yeah. And then I would stop it. I said, we'd preach to each other for a little while and talk about something. Okay, then we'd restart it and we'd go on. And we meditated on it and we shared back and forth and we just had a good time. Yeah. And it was just so refreshing. And I've already told her, I said, you know, she's, uh, this is her last week there at uh, High Point University at work. And uh, once she gets off, we're going to do a few things. But eventually... We're going to go back to Missouri to see Ben. And I told her, I am looking forward to that trip because I want to hear more word. We're going to get in that word together. And she said, we can listen to it here at the house. I said, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. But it's just so nice to be sequestered yeah. in that car. And that you, nothing you can do, nowhere you can go. You can't get distracted. You can't pull up a computer and start doing something. I mean, you're just, just driving, you know. And uh, I just enjoy it. I'm looking forward to doing that again. Just get thoroughly involved in the Word. And I used to just do that all the time. And it's so e easy to get busy and get involved in stuff. And it's all good stuff, but it's not the Word. And when you get in there and just get into it and stay in it, whew, it's just so refreshing. Such a blessing. Hallelujah. Well, I trust you enjoyed this tonight. A little short uh, from last time, but that's okay. We'll unhook here. And uh, we'll go ahead and receive the offering. Those of you who uh, want to tithe and give to Expedition Church, we encourage you to do that. Those of you online can give either by uh, the Square Cash app, which is still um, Faith Victory Church for the Square Cash app, and then donations at fvc.org. Uh, those addresses will be changing as we get the legal paperwork done, but... That'll work for right now. And uh, we'll go ahead and pray over the offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come and receive from you here tonight. Now, Father, we return of our finances, of the tithes and the offerings that we have to give into the ministry. We know that this is good ground to plant seed into. We thank you, Father, for taking this seed and growing it, using it for your ministry and for the benefit of the church. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brother Joe, go ahead and pass that around. Those of you online, go ahead and give electronically. And uh, if you are interested in giving regularly, by the way, to the church, we're going to have ways you can do that online electronically here before too long. Text to give is coming. Uh, you know, online forms, things of that nature. We're working on some things in the background. But, uh, you know, going to make it easy for you to sow seed and uh, have that opportunity to give in to the ministry. We've got things to do. We've got lots to get done here uh, at uh, Expedition Church. Uh, when is the homecoming meeting? What's the date on that? September 25th. September 25th. Mark your calendars. September 25th. Uh, we're going to have homecoming weekend here at the church uh, that Sunday. And... Uh, uh, is it Guy Gierick? Is that how you pronounce it? Is going to be the speaker. Uh, Dean at Rama Bible Training Center will be coming up to hold uh, services for us for homecoming and church dedication. So come on out for that. It's going to be a blessing. And join us next time. Remember, until then, to fulfill the Word of God.